And good morning. How is everyone today? Good. I'm Bill English. And along with Kathy, my wife, we've been attending here for roughly 12 years. Uh, now, for those who are visiting, I want you to know I'm not on staff here, okay? I'm just a lay guy, all right? I am seminary trained to be a pastor, but I happen to be in business. And uh, the business that I'm in is a turnaround business. We take uh, the firm that I'm with, we take uh, companies that are within hours or days of going bankrupt, and we step in and we run them and we turn them and we make them profitable again and we save jobs and we save product lines. In a good year, uh, the 20 of us who work in here, if, we, if, if it's a good year, we'll save over 1,000 jobs, but enough about me. Last fall, Pastor Scott and I started to have discussions around stewardship in our church and what could be done to help others experience God's best for them in the area of stewardship and generosity. Then in early January, Scott asked if I would do a series on stewardship, and that series was originally slated to be delivered after It's Complicated. I mean, you've been coming, you know we're in a series called It's Complicated about relationships. And he had assigned me the last two Sundays in May and the first two in June to do this series. But COVID has affected our staff, right? Pastor Scott and Pastor Robbie both have COVID. Several others have been quarantined due to COVID exposure. And so Steve Olson calls me on Monday and says, Bill, would you just mind moving up your series and doing the next four weeks? And I said, sure. Fortunately, I already had three of the sermons done, so I still have to write the last one, but it's all good, right? So, um, what we're doing is we're taking a pit stop from our current series, It's Complicated. I'm going to do a four-part series on generosity and stewardship called A Generous People. And after that, we'll finish It's Complicated. Okay? So bookend stewardship with It's Complicated. It makes sense to me. And if it's complicated to you, I get that. But this will give our staff time to get past COVID, to rest up and to uh, really get back in the saddle and, and move forward. By the way, I wanted to say that I spoke with Pastor Scott yesterday for a little bit of time. Uh, he's not physically well, uh, but he and Erica are in good spirits. The whole family has COVID right now. But he wanted me to relate to all of you their gratefulness for your prayers, the meals you've brought over, and how you all have supported him and his family. Look, I know he's chomping at the bit to get back here and be with us. Uh, so please keep him in your prayers. And Scott, Erica, we love you, and we do miss you, and, and hope that you and Robbie and everybody else are back soon. Okay, stewardship, a generous people. The purpose in doing this series is to give clear teaching on what the Bible has to say about stewardship and generosity. Okay? I'm not doing this, and they didn't ask me to do this, because the church is hurting for money. We're not. There's no hidden agenda here, okay? Instead, uh, we, want to, we want you to have all that is best from God. And part of having all that is best from God is learning to be generous with him. You're not gonna sh we're not going to shame you. We're not going to guilt trip you, okay? But we love you. And we want what's best for you, and that's being generous is part of that. And we're going to see that over these four weeks. Frankly, next to the problems that we sometimes have in connecting with other people, the connection to our wealth is the most common area where we most likely miss out on God's best. And I recognize that this series <clears throat> probably will be the most direct and sustained teaching on stewardship and generosity that almost everyone is here has heard in a long, long time. I get that. So I'm going to come at this with the assumption that this is new information to you and that these next four Sundays may be life transforming for you. If you really want to draw closer to God, you're not going to be able to do that without becoming generous towards him. You're not going to be able to do that without opening up your checkbook and giving to him. I'm just being gut honest with you guys. But before we ask you to do those kinds of things, I need to lay some groundwork with you. I need to really talk and go back, start at the beginning, and talk about stewardship and generosity. 
So here's the central idea that will sum up all four Sundays in one sentence, all right? You're going, well, then why did it take you four Sundays? Eh. Four Sundays, one sentence, here it is. Disciples of Jesus Christ are faithful to God in stewarding all that he owns by disadvantaging themselves in order to advantage his kingdom. Let me say that again. Disciples of Jesus Christ are faithful to God in stewarding all that he owns by disadvantaging themselves in order to advantage his kingdom. Let me give you a sneak preview for these four Sundays. Today, we're going to look at the context of stewardship. We're going to talk about covenants, faithfulness, believing. What we'll learn is believing loyalty. That'll be a phrase that you'll walk away with today. And we'll learn that covenants really form the context for stewardship and generosity. This is going to be a heavy day today, so I'm going to ask you to listen well, okay? Put on your thinking caps and, and listen well, all right? Next Sunday is the foundation of stewardship, specifically ownership and entrustments. We're going to talk about the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 and some other verses and other passages that go along with that. And we'll learn that God owns everything and all which we have means that we're just merely stewards of what he has entrusted to us. Then on May 9th, Mother's Day, we're going to do the life of stewardship. We're going to look at a biblical view of debt and saving and hoarding. We're going to learn that the Bible discourages but does not prohibit debt. And we're also going to learn that hoarding is really excessive saving. And then on May 16th, we're going to look at the heart of stewardship. We're going to look at a biblical view of generosity and giving within the context of our covenant relationship with God. Now, in some ways, I've been preparing for this series for the last five years. I just finished a writing project in this area. And I have come to fully believe something that I, wanna, I want you to grasp, and it's this. That financial generosity is the solution to so many problems in our church and in our society that it is difficult to overstate or exaggerate the importance of Christians becoming generous with their money and their wealth. I believe that to my core. And I hope by the end of these four weeks, some of you really start to grasp that with me. Now, in the first part of this sermon, I'm going to rely on two mentors that I have. Um, one is Dr. Michael Heiser. Some of you might know him, his books. His podcast is uh, the Naked Bible Podcast. Now, don't let the title fool you and don't let it offend you. What he does is he takes all the baggage and all the stuff that we put on Scripture, and he takes all that off, and he just exegetes the inspired Word of God. He's amazing. Um, if you're interested, it's episode 350. It was really a, a core source for my sermon this morning. The other mentor is one of my seminary professors whom I learned about covenants from, Dr. McComiskey. He wrote a book called The Covenants of Promise. I highly recommend both works uh, to you, both, both men and their works to you, but uh, I got to warn you, it's really academic stuff, okay? God has chosen to implement his redemptive, redemptive plan through covenant relationships, and it is within the relationship of covenants that God will ask us to steward all that he has entrusted to us. Covenants are rarely taught in evangelical churches. We tend, in our evangelicalness, we tend to think of salvation in terms of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, in which our sins are forgiven, and we try as best we can to live righteously before God. All that's true, but it lacks the larger intertestamental context of covenants. Many think that the new covenants, or the new covenant in the New Testament, did away with all of the Old Testament covenants, but that isn't true either. What we'll learn this morning is that the promises in the Old Testament covenants are enforced today and will be throughout eternity. How we obey them changes with the new covenant. We don't do the Old Testament law. How we obey those covenants changes, but the promises themselves do not change. So what I'm going to do here is look at three terms in the Old Testament. We're really going to look at two and then add a third one in. Then we're going to look at uh, John 14. We're going to look at Deuteronomy 7. And then we're going to uh, continue on and flesh this out even more, okay? 
Now, my voice is a bit raspy this morning, so there we go. So in the Old Testament, there are two words associated with each other that express the concept of covenants. The first one is the Hebrew word for loving kindness. Loving kindness is a straightforward phrase, and it means to be gracious and loving towards one who is in a covenant with you, okay? It's not a spontaneous emotion. It's not an uncontrolled love. It is a decisional, intentional love. Sometimes it's translated as steadfast love, okay? Loving kindness is often associated, when you see it, you'll often see in the context around it, the concepts of obligation and performance, okay? So loving kindness. The next word is faithfulness. The reason loving kindness appears so much with obligation and performance is that it really often appears with the word, the Hebrew word for faithfulness, what we translate as faithfulness. And when they are used together, as they often are, we have the concepts of love and loyalty linked together. When we combine loving kindness with loyalty, we have a more accurate understanding of what the Old Testament fathers would have thought of in terms of covenants. Okay? And this is where the phrase, you're going to hear in a little bit, the phrase believing loyalty. This is the genesis of that. Now, finally, the word covenant itself appears quite often with the word faithfulness and the word loving kindness. We'll see those three together many times in the Old Testament. So your trio is loving kindness, faithfulness, and covenant. Are you with me? Yes, Bill. Good. Now, you're going to have to stay with me some more. I know I'm just kind of, I dove in the deep end, and I am taking you underneath the water with me, and we're going to go down to the bottom, and then we're going to come back up. So I want you to stay with me, okay? Hang in there. Love, love, hang in there. Let's look at Abram's covenant with God in Genesis 12. Now, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, by the way, I'm using the ESV here, not the NIV, okay? What did God promise Abraham? Five things, right? That he would make Abram's descendants into a great nation. That's us, okay? He would bless Abram. His name would be great. He would have God's protection and he would be a blessing to others, okay? Protection is part of the covenant. And we're going to come back to that in a future sermon about how we come under God's protection when we obey and we, we uh, are not under God's protection when we disobey, okay? Now, many believe this Abrahamic covenant to be unconditional with no strings attached, but this isn't the case. Covenants always come with stipulations. They always contain benefits for obedience and penalties for disobedience. Let's go to Genesis 17 where the Abrahamic covenant language is repeated, but it's now linked to Abraham becoming circumcised. In other words, Abraham being obedient. This is a little bit long. Stay with me. And God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. That's the plural of Abram. Abraham is the plural of Abram. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. <clears throat> I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. Stop there for just a moment. This is why we know that the promises of the covenants never end. It's phraseology like this. I will, make, uh, I will establish after you through the generations for an everlasting covenant, right? That's how we know that the promises of the covenants never end. I'm going to continue on. To be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, 
<coughs> you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Now here's the stipulation. Here's the part of obedience that Abraham had to comply with. It's in verse 10. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Here it is. Every male among you must be circumcised. Now, Abraham couldn't just, I'm going to go off script here for a moment. Abraham just couldn't say, you know, that's going to hurt. I don't think I'll do that. But God, you promised, so you have to continue to give me all your promises because you promised and you're God and you never change. No, covenants don't work that way. There are benefits for obedience, and then there's penalties for disobedience in a covenant, right? We're going to see that more in Deuteronomy 7. So in order for Abraham to enjoy the benefits of his covenant with God, he had to obey God by becoming circumcised. So at the young age of 99, Abraham obeys, and all the males in his house along with him were circumcised. When Abraham obeys, it is because he believes in the God who promised him. He believes in the terms that God promised in his covenant in Genesis 12 and was repeated in Genesis 17. And he believes that God will deliver. Catch this. Because Abraham believes, he obeys. That's why the phrase believing loyalty is an accurate phrase that describes how the Bible views salvation across both testaments. We believe, and because we believe, we want to obey. We demonstrate our loyalty to God through obedience. Our obedience is our way of expressing our believing loyalty in God. When we believe, our hearts are transformed and we want to obey. In a covenant relationship, we become his people, and he becomes our God. Believing loyalty means that we don't switch gods. We don't swap out gods. We don't run to Allah or Moroni or Buddha or some other god. We don't try to syncretize them and make them all work together, okay? We are loyal to believe in the God of the Bible as he presents himself in the Bible. He is our God. We are his people. We are in a covenant with God, okay? Now, those who spurn God's love, who choose not to enter a covenant, they're not recipients of his loving kindness. They're not recipients of his faithfulness, okay? You have to choose to enter into a covenant relationship with him. You must believe that God can deliver on his promises and that no one else can. And this is consistent across both testaments, those who enter into a covenant relationship with God believe that only he is able to save them from their sins. Only he is able to give them life eternal in his presence. Only God is able to do this. We believe this, and we become his people, and he becomes our God, and he literally transforms our hearts from the inside out. We're going to see this in a little bit through Ezekiel. Now hang with me. There's a corporate aspect to covenants, not just an individual aspect, okay? When God says, and I'm paraphrasing here, I will establish my covenant between me and you and I will be your God, he is speaking both corporately and individually. This is where it is important to understand that when we enter into a covenant relationship with God, we are transferred from one kingdom to another, okay? From one family to to another, from one nation to another. Colossians 1.13, Paul writes about Christ. For he has rescued us, he being Christ, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. All the adoption language in the New Testament is about this as well. We are adopted into the family. We were in this family, now we're in that family because we were adopted. There's all kinds of language in the New Testament to show that we are going from point A to point B. And point A is the place where you don't want to be, and point B is where you want to be. Okay? Being brought into his kingdom means that we enjoy the benefits of fellowship with each other. And we also enjoy the loving kindness and loyalty of others who themselves have covenanted with God. We commit ourselves to others in our church because they too have covenanted with God. 
So we need to see ourselves as connected to a larger whole whom God is building together to do significant ministries in our communities. And so we stick with each other. We hang with each other, right? We do this because of love and loyalty, the foundations of a covenant relationship. And I'm just going to go off script again for just a moment. This, I, folks, it's 4.30 in the morning, and it's dark outside. But 5.30 is just an hour away, and the dawn is coming, and this church is poised to do significant ministry in our communities if we will just get some things right. We are just on the cusp of really becoming effective. We're, we're good. We're not great yet. We're good but we have a ways to go as a church. We're not that far away. That's all I better say. Back to script. This is why Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 8, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. When we love others, we're being loyal to them. And when we give love and loyalty to each other, we're living out a covenant relationship with each other and with God. Now, we see all these elements in Deuteronomy 7, verses 9 through 14. Here we go. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Stop right there. Do you see the three words? Do you see them? Do you see faithfulness? Do you see covenant? Do you see loving kindness, also translated as steadfast love? You see all three there, right? They're associated with each other. I'm going to continue on now. He repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. This means that those who spurn God's love do not enjoy loving kindness and the faithfulness of God. Only those who choose to enter into a covenant relationship with him. He will not be slack with the one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. And because you listen to these rules and keep and do them, the Lord your, here's the blessings, the Lord your God will keep you, <coughs> keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that he swore to your fathers. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. Here's the benefits of being in the covenant. He will also bless the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, your grain, your wine, your oil, the increase of your herds, the young of your flock, and the land that he swore to your fathers. You will be blessed above all peoples. <clears throat> this is the, um, you're now seeing the, the benefits of being in a covenant with God. So in this passage, we see all the elements of a covenant. We see both love and loyalty. We see our response of believing loyalty. We see God's loving kindness. And it's, again, it's translated as steadfast love. We see his faithfulness. We see loving kindness, faithfulness, covenant, all in the same passage. Are you with me? <clears throat> Good. I'll take that rousing response. John 14. It's also in the New Testament. Are you ready? This is Christ speaking with his disciples in his farewell discourse as he is facing crucifixion. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me, Christ says. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Again, this is the ESV. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Again, what do we see? <clears throat> we see believing loyalty. We see that those who believe are also loyal. They are obedient. And those who believe obey God, and they obey God because they believe. So one of the big takeaways this morning, hang with me here, stay with me. One of the big takeaways this morning is this. When we enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not a relationship in which we enjoy a full suite of fire-saving benefits where obedience is optional. That's not what this is. That's not biblical salvation. Instead, we enter into a personal relationship with God where we enter into a covenant relationship in which we obey because we believe. 
We enter into the relationship which we pledge ourselves to be faithful to him, knowing that he will be faithful to us. It is a covenant, and belief must precede behavior. It's not optional. You can't earn your salvation. You can't obey and then believe. You must believe and then obey. <clears throat> and by faith, you obey, and that's when obedience follows. Now, let me give you one note of encouragement here, because some of you might be feeling a little beat up right now. And the encouragement is this. That which cannot be gained through performance cannot be lost through lack of performance. Let me say that again. That which cannot be gained through performance cannot be lost through lack of performance. Okay? We don't gain our salvation through our performance because our performance has to follow belief. But we also don't lose our salvation through lack of performance even though we believe. Okay? The basis of our covenant with God is focused on believing loyalty to God. We don't switch gods, but we keep the right order in mind too. We believe first in faith, then we obey. This is essential and it is consistent in both Testaments. Salvation comes through genuine belief. You don't obey to believe, you believe and then you obey. Now, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> believing loyalty was evidenced by keeping the law, the Old Testament law. You believed, so you obeyed the law. But over the years, the decades, and maybe even the millennia, the Old Testament law devolved to a system of duty where outward obedience became all that mattered. It didn't matter what you believed internally. As long as you obeyed the law, you were good. Believing loyalty didn't matter. And what they did was they put the cart before the horse. And then they strongly supported the cart being before the horse. So when Christ came, he ushered in a new covenant, which was initially outlined in the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So I'm going to read just a portion of this uh, from Isaiah, or from, I'm sorry, from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and 33. Jeremiah says this about the new covenant. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Do you hear that covenant phraseology again? I will be their God, they will be my people. But now what the difference is, he's going to write his law into our hearts and onto our minds. Okay, it's no longer an outward system where we have to obey to demonstrate that we believe. Now he's going to come in and he's going to write that right onto our hearts. When God writes his law on our hearts, he is transforming our hearts to love what he loves and to hate what we, he hates. That which brings God joy will bring us joy. That which brings God sorrow will bring us sorrow. And the love that we need to have for him in order to be faithful to him in our covenant relationship with him, he'll give that to us as well. <clears throat> now, as part of this new covenant, God places his spirit within us. Let's read Ezekiel uh, chapter 36, 25 through 28. This is Ezekiel writing. I will, and he's, he's channeling God and writing it down on paper. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanlinesses. I don't know how to say that word. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. And here's that phraseology again. You shall be my people and I will be your God. There's the covenant language. Okay? But as part of this new covenant, God puts his spirit within us, and he will move us, literally cause us, to follow his decrees and his laws. Now that's inner transformation. Not outward obedience to a law, but transformation from the inside out. But similar to how we must choose to enter into a covenant with God, we must choose to allow God to transform us, okay? We can resist the Spirit's work within us. We can resist God writing his laws in our minds and in our hearts. We're not passive. We're not robots. God doesn't reprogram us with a new set of code. 
to cause us to behave a certain way, okay? No, we believe, then we obey. And when we obey, we cooperate with God to allow him to write his laws into our minds and our hearts so that our minds and our hearts are transformed. Honestly, I think this is how lukewarm Christians come to be. They don't let God finish his work in them. They embrace the parts of Christianity that they like and they reject the parts that they don't like. You know, it's like I'll have three of those and two of them and 16 of these, but all that stuff, no, I don't want that. It's like they're in a candy store and they just want certain candies. The parts that are inconvenient, the parts that ask for sacrifice, the parts that ask us to believe in spite of our experiences, the parts that touch their money and their wealth, yeah, we don't like that. So they pick and choose which parts of Christianity they'll accept, and sometimes they do that with other religions, and they try to put it together, and that's called syncretism, which is wholly unbiblical. For example, next Sunday, I'll be teaching that God owns everything, including all of your money. It's not like God gets 10% and you get 90%. That's really unbiblical. That's not a biblical way to look at this. He owns all of your money. We're merely stewards of what he owns. This means he gets to tell us how to spend it. In other words, we spend the money in our bank accounts at his discretion, not ours. We go into debt when he tells us to. Otherwise, we don't. Some will not like this teaching. Their challenge really is this. When we teach the plain reading of the Bible, will they allow God to write that onto their minds and and hearts, or will they reject it? That's really the decision that they're going to have to make next Sunday. Lukewarm Christians are those who are trying to gain the benefits of a covenant relationship with God while also holding tight to the things of this world. They love the things of this world while trying to love God. And I think if you caught them in a quiet moment, if they were honest with you, they would tell you they have a lot of conflicts going on inside of them about this. At the heart of this series... Ladies and gentlemen, family of God, people whom I love, at the heart of this series is your heart. Giving is always a heart issue. It is never about capacity or ability. Never. If the widow could give two copper coins and give more than all the rich people gave, then you know it's not about capacity or ability. If all you have to give is 50 cents, then you give it. And you know why? Because God can take 50 cents and he can multiply it to 500 million if he wants to. This is about your heart. And your heart is going to be challenged in this series. My heart has been challenged just by writing this stuff and getting ready for this. So what have we learned this morning? I'm sorry I went off script there. What have we learned this morning? First, we have learned that a personal relationship with God is really a covenant relationship in which love and loyalty are combined. And secondly, we have learned that if we are to enter fully the new covenant, then we must allow God to fully write his law into our minds and our hearts to transform how we think and what we love. You cannot have all of what God wants to give you. I want you to catch this. Listen to this. You cannot have all of what God wants to give you while still loving the things of this world. You can't have God's best and the best of the world at the same time. You just can't. You have to make a choice. Disciples of Jesus Christ are faithful to God in stewarding all that he owns by disadvantaging themselves in order to advantage his kingdom. I'm going to ask that we do something that we don't normally do here at the Grove. I'm going to ask you kind of to bow your heads, and I want you to close your eyes and start listening to the Holy Spirit, if you would, please. As I wrap up this morning, I have one question and one invitation. One question and one invitation. First, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you consider yourself a Christian, then my question for you this morning is this. Will you pledge yourself to God and let him fully write his laws into your mind and your heart? Will you demonstrate believing loyalty by allowing God to write his laws on your mind and your heart? 
My invitation is for those who don't know if they have truly entered into a covenant relationship with God. If you're listening this morning and you're sensing that you don't have a personal covenant relationship with God, then my invitation to you is to invite him into your heart and pledge yourself to him this morning. And you can do this just by praying with me. I'm going to pray a phrase and you can pray it after me in your mind. You don't need to say it out loud. It's what's in your heart that matters. Okay, Christians are praying, God, I confess that I have sinned and broken your law. I want to enter a covenant relationship with you. I ask that you come into my heart and forgive my sin. I make you the Lord of my life. I give to you my life for whatever days I have left on this earth. And by faith, I thank you for saving me and for pledging yourself to me. Now, with everybody still down, if you have made a decision for the first time to enter into a covenant relationship with Christ, would you mind just slipping up your hand and putting it right back down? Yes, yes others thank you yes let's come back together if you have made a decision to enter into a covenant relationship with Christ I want you to tell somebody today there will be people down here afterwards that you can pray with and I'll be here you can always talk with me or our prayer team or you can go out to the connect center and someone will be wanting to talk with you and pray with you And if you don't have a church home, we would love to get you connected here at the Grove to see how we can help you with your journey with God. Happily, catch this, every day in Jesus Christ can be a fresh, new day. It can all, every day, did you catch it? Every day can be a new beginning. Isn't that something? Doesn't matter what you've done in the past. There's no amount of sin that you can commit that God cannot forgive. There's nothing that you've done that is stronger than the love of Jesus Christ. Every day can be a new beginning. And I want to invite every one of you to start that fresh start today, if you've not already done so. Let's pray. Father God, I am just so grateful that you have chosen us before the foundation of this world to be in a relationship with you, to be in a covenant with you. Thank you that you have pledged yourself to us. Thank you, God, that you have died on the cross for us. Thank you, God, that you have done things within us that we could never do within ourselves. Thank you that you give us an eternal future with you that is sure and secure. Thank you, God. You are a great and awesome and almighty God. You are the everlasting Father. You are the Prince of Peace. You are the one who forgives our sin. And Father, you are wonderful. You are good, God, and what you do is good. And we love you for it. I pray that you would bring revival to this church. I pray that you would bring revival to this community. And I pray that it would start with us. We love you, God. Thank you for the time here this morning. It's been powerful. I appreciate it. In your name, amen.